Okay, we're now at chapter 17. And chapter 17 and 18, this is going to be a very important parenthetical uh, chapter. It's a timeout uh, so that uh, uh, the Spirit can explain to John uh, just what all is going on and just give a little more story of what's going on behind the scenes and, and uh, the reason why. So chapter 17 is going to deal with Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great Prostitute, the Great City, and the Scarlet Beast. So, and this is going to be for two chapters, for two chapters. So we had the seven bowls of Revelation uh, 16 that uh, was all about God's punishment and the wrath on the Antichrist and his kingdom and unrepentant mankind. And now Revelation 17 is going to identify for us Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes, and of earth's abominations. Now, she is introduced uh, by an angel. In fact, one of the angels that, uh, that uh, dished out one of the seven bowls. Um, but before that, we were introduced by an angel in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, where one of the angels flying through the sky just said something, uh, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And so that was the first mention of Babylon the Great. And it's like, whoa, who says Babylon the Great? And I definitely don't want to be part of that. Well, that was going to be explained further. All right. Um, so her destruction by God with the seventh bowl that we just read about is just the second mention of Babylon the Great. And so just to refresh our memory, Revelation 16, 19, the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and God remembered what? Babylon the Great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So this is just the second mention of Babylon the Great. Really nothing has been explained other than what we just heard. Now we have two full chapters, chapters 17 and 18. That's about nothing but, almost, of Babylon the Great. But that's the, the main subject of these two chapters. So, obviously, Babylon the Great is not a trivial subject, okay? In fact, this is the longest prophecy or the longest oracle of any one subject in all of New Testament. Okay, uh, so this is very important, and this also is not the Antichrist. All right, so let's move on. Let's look at some of the classic interpretations of Babylon the Great, because um, th this is uh, uh, what mainstream uh, th uh, Christian theology uh, basically uh, interprets. Okay, first and foremost, a little background, Revelation presents two contrasting cities just in the book of Revelation. So there's the city of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is uh, portrayed as the bride, the bride of Christ, or the, the bride in the making. Uh, and then we got Babylon now, and Babylon is portrayed as the prostitute, okay? Um, and now when we go back and look at Old Testament examples, we got two very primary examples in the Old Testament of two cities portrayed as a prostitute, and that was Nineveh and Tyre. Okay, as far as Nineveh is concerned, a good representative uh, scripture passage is Nahum 3, verse 1, where it says, Woe to the bloody city! all full of lies and plunder, and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. So there's a charm about her. Behold, I am against you, declares Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, and all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh, who will grieve for her? And 
course, we just read of that about Babylon. Then we got Tyre, Isaiah 23, verse 17, where he says, At the end of 70 years, the Lord, Yahweh, will visit Tyre, and she will return to her wages and will prostitute herself with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Now, when we're talking about prostituting herself, yeah, I'm sure prostitution was alive and well, but um, the spiritual prostitution is really the, the main key and subject here. Whenever a uh, man would turn away from God and seek a replacement in the place of God, so an idol, idol worship instead of worshiping the, the creator of heaven and earth, that was prostitution. That was the wayward wife. All right. And many commentators agree that Nineveh and Tyre, they're types and foreshadows of the Babylon to come. And I agree 100%. However, many, 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 most theologians believe that it is Rome that is the revised eighth kingdom, which we will read about. Uh, the kingdom of feet and toes uh, that we read about in Daniel 2. And that Rome is the city that is mentioned here in Revelation because Rome sits on seven hills, okay? Uh, seven hills, seven mountains, we're going to get there. Others see Babylon as, uh, as just so big, so pervasive, so global that it's not really a city, it's just a world economic system. And then, of course, uh, we could... Uh, uh, relate that to what's going on now in the world today uh, with the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, the Fourth uh, Industrial Revolution that Klaus uh, Schwab is trying to, uh, and Bill Gates and others are trying to uh, push forward in our world. Uh, we got some that believe, no, Babylon the Great is the Jewish people because the Jewish people have been portrayed both as a bride when they gave their their attention, affections to Yahweh, or as a harlot when they turn their back against Yahweh, against God Almighty. Then we got others that, uh, that say, no, 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 the great, Babylon the Great is New York City. Well, I'm not going to go into uh, very much there other than just to say, forget anything outside of Israel and the Middle East. That is the subject matter of the Bible that is the subject matter of Revelation. Now, as for us, we're going to look at the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Caliphate. Uh, that was, uh, we had already discussed, that was um, our interpretation of the feet and toes in Daniel 2. Um, our interpretation of the, t of the terrifying uh, fourth uh, beast, that is a kingdom in Daniel 7. And that all in all is, is the revised Eighth Empire found in Revelation 17 and the city that sits on seven mountains. So uh, with that, let's just review the context that led us to this foregone conclusion that we're looking at the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Caliphate, all right? So remember the, the uh, vision no, the dream, the dream given to Nebuchadnezzar, where there's this giant statue with the head of the gold, and, and you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, is the head of the gold. Everything revolves around you. Well, guess what? You're going to be replaced. That is the chest and arms of silver. That will be the medial Persians. And then they're going to be replaced. They, they will be overcome by Alexander the Great. And so that's the belly and thighs of bronze. And then before long, Alexander the Great dies. You got the four kings, and then you got the Seleucids and the Ptolemies and the back and forth there. But ultimately, in the end, it's all going to be overtaken by Rome. That will be the legs of the iron and the feet of iron and clay, right? Really? Are we sure? Rome? 
well, let's look at it again. And then, of course, there's the crushing rock, uh, which is the kingdom of God, the everlasting kingdom. So we said, time out. Let's look and see if it's really Rome or if it's another kingdom that follows Rome. And then as we start to compare this to Revelation, that makes even more sense. Okay? So what we did was we looked at the re scriptural requirements of the fourth kingdom, of the Iron Legs kingdom, and it was supposed to be what? Strong as iron. Okay, Rome was strong. That's a definite given. And it shall break and crush all that remained of the previous three kingdoms. So in other words, each kingdom succeeds uh, the what was originally the Babylonian Empire. So the Babylonian Empire, that territory was succeeded by the Medial Persians. That territory was succeeded by uh, Alexander the Great. And then that was uh, succeeded by uh, the, the, who? Let's double check. So, the head, that was Babylonia. And of course, you see the rivers and uh, the Tigris and Euphrates and, and Babylon, the red dot. Okay, so that's the head of the vision, the head of the statue. And then, yes, below that was the chest and arms of silver, the second great beast, um, which was Medo-Persia. And that definitely fit the prophecy to a T. And then we got a little more expansion of Alexander the Great. Once again, just totally surrounding and taking over what had been Babylonian. Not only what had been Babylonian, but what had been Medo-Persia. So it fits perfectly. And then we come to Rome. And it's like, I don't think so. The Roman Empire, as great as it was, was not Babylonian-centric. As you can see, it was very much Eurocentric. In fact, we could make the statement it's not even attached to the head of the statue. It's not attached to the Babylonian Empire with only a one slight sliver that borders uh, the eastern Mediterranean Sea. So it just does not fit. And regrettably, theologians tried to make it fit, and they'll try to make it fit in Revelation as well. So we, we dismiss Rome and we say, well, okay, what happened after Rome? There's got to be something after Rome. Well, it's like, duh. Uh, and what that was, was the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Caliphate. And as we can see, it just totally, massively overtook all the other three kingdoms. Terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. Uh, which is the scriptural requirements. Um, also a very long-lasting empire. So then we looked and says, okay, let's just compare the criteria. Well, first and foremost, even the name Islam means what? Submission. Submission to the laws of Allah. And then we looked at what did the Islamic caliphate did compared to the Romans? Well, the Islamic caliphate, they dictated law, they dictated governments, they dictated language, military, sexual and hygienic practices. They imposed the Arabic language on its conquered people. Uh, and we even got those that uh, still are speaking that language today, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, North Africa. Uh, a lot of Egypt. Um, so, I mean, this is also very, very important if we're considering a revised kingdom. Okay, a revised kingdom. Well, are they still speaking the language? Yes. What about religion? The Islamic Caliphate, they imposed their religion and their culture on everybody that they conquered. That wasn't the case with Rome. In fact, uh, Rome, we remember King Herod, he remodeled the temple for the, for the Jewish people. So, no. And he definitely, they did not uh, impose Latin in the Middle East. It's just not there and just did not meet that qualification. We also looked at the history, how the Islam started with the Arabs uh, in 634 to 44, the first 10 years. They conquered such some 36,000 cities, destroyed some 4,000 Christian churches and erected some 1,400 Muslim mosques. We did not see that with the Roman Empire. So the Islamic Caliphate of the Ottoman Empire is the perfect example of a totalitarian regime and ideology. 
So, having looked at that, it was like, okay, that's good. Now let's look at the feet and toes kingdom because the feet and toes kingdom has to come from the iron legs kingdom. So, if it's Rome, then we got to have a revised Roman Empire. And do we see the signs of that happening? If it's Islam and an Islam caliphate, then we got to see the makings of a revised Islamic caliphate on the horizon. Okay? And so, we read that this will be the existing kingdom, the resurrected uh, iron legs, the fourth kingdom in, in Daniel 7. Uh, that will be the Antichrist kingdom. This is the kingdom that God is going to break into pieces. The iron portion has got to be strong, but this kingdom is going to have feet of iron and clay, making this kingdom partly strong, partly brittle. In fact, the, one of the requirements is they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. So is this a riddle or is this a literal? I would have to say the answer is yes to both. Um, and then, of course, also um, every kingdom must succeed the original Babylonian king, uh, kingdom. So um, as far as mixed and mixed marriages... In Daniel 2, and, and this part of Daniel is, is written in Aramaic, it's not in Hebrew, uh, where we read, And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it shall be what? A divided kingdom. As you saw the iron mix with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. So it's a divided kingdom mix, and they will mix one another in marriage. But... They will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. So the iron and clay, they does not hold together, okay? Well, the Aramaic word of what the, all this was written in, remember this is written in, in Aramaic, when it came to the word mixed, the word is Arab. Whoa! And its Hebrew clear equivalent is also very similar, Arab. Uh, and then we let's trace back the, the heritage of... Um, of um, the Arabs. Well, they come from the descendants of Ishmael and Esau. And they, by the way, had intermarried, mixed marriages, among with the desert pagan tribes. And they became collectively known as the mixed ones. Hmm. This is also the origin of the Arabs' present name. The modern-day name of Arabs means the mixed desert people. So we can kind of check, tick off the, the box there of meeting a scriptural requirement. Um, also, uh, we have that they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. Well, what happened after Muhammad's death? Muhammad was a minority of Islam then and Islam now. Uh, called the Shia, the Shia minority sect. It's about 14% today. And then you have the Sunnis uh, that are about 86%. Well, Muhammad, because he was Shia, his, um, his uh, relatives, they go, oh, somebody's got to take over uh, from Muhammad, and, well, we just got to continue the bloodline. All right? True. No, says the Sunnis, not the bloodline loyalty. We have been the ones that have been loyal to Muhammad. It has to be uh, from the Sunni um, variant of uh, Islam. And then, of course, we know what happened there. It resulted in a never-ending bloodshed of sectarian violence. Uh, and even to this day, that sectarian violence is alive and well. So all that to say is that the Islamic empire, it's a perfect fit of the Daniel prophecies. And here's the feet and toes uh, uh, kingdom today distributed between uh, Sunnis in light uh, green and the Shias in dark green, uh, which is primarily in Iran. But there's a lot of division, a lot of bad blood, and a lot of hate, and a lot of killing between the Sunnis and the Shias. Okay. 
Uh, that ticked the box loud and clear. And we did one more criteria if we call. It's like, well, hang on now. God has prophesied, <clears throat> excuse me, with his prophets that I'm going to go back and destroy these nations. Well, what are these nations? So we went and looked, and we saw first the coalition nations in Psalms 83, and guess what? Uh, you look at the old names and line them up with modern names of Jordan, of Saudi Arabia, Syria, Golan Heights, Negev, Palestinian Authority, Gaza Strip, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iran, Iraq. Oh, there's nothing Roman about them. They're all 100%. Islamic. And then we looked at some of the nations that God said he's going to destroy on that day. And that included Cush, Sudan, Egypt, uh, Put, which is Libya, North Africa, Lud, which is uh, Turkey, Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Libya. Guess what? They're all Islamic nations. We looked at Zephaniah. He added a few more um, and uh, that included, uh, well, Mosul, northern Iraq, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Syria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they're all Islamic. So once again, we felt very comfortable that the Islamic Caliphate or the Ottoman Empire, uh, which, by the way, we also looked at where. President Ergaman of uh, Turkey is trying to resurrect what? The Ottoman Empire. He, he wants to see the glory given back to Turkey. So then we said, okay, uh, if this is a revised empire, a revised kingdom that's going to be the Antichrist kingdom, is there any evidence today that uh, there's a kingdom out there that's ready for revision? Well, so we looked at the Islamic countries that are in the world today. 51 countries, and the overwhelming majority of them surround little tiny Israel. Uh, if you think that's a coincidence, um, then you don't understand the sovereignty of God. And then also we looked at Islamic prophecy uh, because Islam has their own version of end time events. And then we looked at where uh, here's a hadith. A hadith is a proclamation by Muhammad. It's a saying. It's pretty much on even uh, level of authority as uh, the Quran itself. And here's a hadith. It indicates that black flags coming from the area of Khorasan. So this is in the area of like Iran will signify the appearance of the Mahdi is nigh. Who is Mahdi? Mahdi is the Islamic version of the Messiah that's going to save the world and, and lead the charge of exterminating the infidels of the world. Khorasan is in today's Iran, and some scholars have said that the Hadith means when the black flags appear from Central Asia, so all the stand states in the direction of Khorasan, then the appearance of the Mahdi is imminent. So the Islamic world today is looking to the east, is looking to the stand states. When I mean stand states, everything from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, they're looking in that direction for the coming one the Messiah. His name is Mahdi, and he will lead the charge in taking away the infidels. Uh, no power will be able to stop them, and they will finally reach Elah. Elah is Jerusalem, where they will plant and erect their black flag. And we talked about the black flag that basically says in, in um, Arabic, there is no God other than Allah. Okay, <clears throat> now with that as an introduction, let's take it to uh, Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come and I will show you the judgment 
of the great prostitute. So finally, we're going to get an explanation of who is this great prostitute. What has she done that make God so angry? The great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth had committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. Whoa. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had the beast seven heads and ten horns hmm we've read about that before okay so let's start unpacking this okay the great prostitute is a city of idolatry that's what spiritual prostitution is all about of epic proportions so uh, that's the reason why it's not only she's not only a prostitute she's a great prostitute okay and we will read a little more about that when we get to verse 5 in chapter 17. But nevertheless, for now, Isaiah uh, and Jeremiah, they should look at what they had to say. Isaiah 121, how the faithful city has become a whore, she who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Whoa. Jeremiah 3, one. if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him, becomes another man's wife, um, that's prostitution. Will he return to her? Would that not, would not that land be greatly polluted? You have played the whore with many lovers and you would return to me, declares the Lord Yahweh. So that kind of gives us a, a, a good flavor of what idolatry is all about. Uh, this, uh, this great prostitute, is seated on many waters. Okay. Now we can take this literally or we could take it figuratively. It might be both because lots of times sea in many waters is, is a, the sea of Gentiles, but also literally. Uh, this could be a port uh, city or it could be a city that's near the sea. And that is going to be further clarified when we get into Revelation chapter 18. But let's just kind of give a, a quick preview. Uh, where Revelation 18, 17 says, All shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea. So this, this maritime industry. Well, they stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. This is Babylon the Great. What a city was like, the great city. So Babylon the Great is definitely a city. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth had committed sexual immorality. So her influence affects what? The kings of the earth. It's a, she has a global influence, okay? And we will get into that in greater detail. Um, and uh, she is, the spirit took John, what, into a wilderness. The word for wilderness really means desert. Uh, and this is the difference between Middle Eastern uh, perspective and, shall we say, uh, in our area of the world in the in Southwest United States. For us, the wilderness is uh, ponderosa pines or uh, other pine trees and and uh, clear running of streams and waterfalls and all that. That's not the case in the Middle East. Middle East is dry, barren desert. Okay, and the word is eremos, uh, and that's exactly what it means. Isaiah kind of uh, uh, adds to this where he says, the oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. It comes from the wilderness, from a terrible land. They prepare the table, they spread the rugs, they eat, they drink. So this is like um, indulgence. All right, now rise, O princes, oil the shield. For thus the Lord said to me, go set a watchman, let him announce what he sees. And he answered, fallen, fallen is Babylon. So um, what the angel said back in, earlier in Revelation is um, also coming from Isaiah. 
Anyway, this uh, woman is sitting on a scarlet beast, but we're told that this scarlet beast has, what, seven heads and ten horns. So we have Babylon the Great and the beast, which is Antichrist. Um, they and his kingdom, they begin, they begin as allies. And the question is, how long will they be allies? Well, let's read on. Because, um, okay, the scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had seven heads and ten horns. Well, we've, like I said, this is, this is right out of Revelation chapter 12 where we saw the great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems. And this was also prophet, prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before as the fourth kingdom in Daniel. And just briefly, we'll read that, Daniel 7, 23. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. That's the, the t dreadfully terrifying and strong kingdom, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. And as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. And another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. So there's our seven. And he shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's the great tribulation. And shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand. For how long? Time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So let's read on. This woman, well, she was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and she was adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, and holy in her hand was a golden cup full of the abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead... Everybody seems to have something on their forehead in, in uh, this day of age in Revelation. On her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes and of earth's abominations. So this great prostitute, this woman, she's arrayed in, in purple and scarlet. Well, these are colors of royalty, so expect her to be of royal lineage. However, there's also in, in scarlet, well, scarlet also signifies sin. As Isaiah said, though your sins are like scarlet. But she lives, not only lives a life of luxury uh, with gold and jewels and pearls, but she lives a life of excessive luxury, massive luxury, excessive wealth. Wealth and luxury that it's hard for our minds to even fathom. And holding in her hand is a golden cup. Gold, of course, but what is it full of? Abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. So she's a product of high society sins, um, high society uh, ideology, uh, worshiping the world, worshiping themselves, and sexual immorality. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, John, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So this great prostitute, this woman that John is seeing, uh, she's drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So she's known for massive persecution and killing. Um, let's put this in an Islamic context. Beheading 
of many Christians. Okay. Um, and Revelation 18, 24, And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who have slain the earth. So she doesn't come from the seed of the woman. She comes from the seed of the serpent. However, John, now seeing what he's seeing and knows what he knows, when he looks at her and he says, When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Whoa. Whoa. I think John was spellbound by her, perhaps by her beauty. I mean, stop and think about it. The ways of the world, uh, the ways of the prostitute, um, it's not colored ugly. It's colored in wealth and beauty and attraction and sexual attraction or financial attraction. Um it's all about me, right? Until the angel gives John a reality check. John, well, the word for marvel here, uh, thalmezo, it means to admire, to regard with admiration, wonder at, to reverence, to marvel. So beware of the lure of the world and the temptations of the world. Verse 7, but the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, yes, they will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. And so this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Okay, now we know. Oh, there's more. They are also seven kings. Okay, so we got seven mountains and seven kings. Well, five of them, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet even come. And when he does come, he must remain only for a little while. And as for the beast that was and is, is not, it is an eighth. So we got another beast. But it belongs to the seven. So it's seven Revise seven resurrected, and it goes to destruction. So, wow. Many believe it is Rome that is the revised eighth empire. And the woman is Rome because Rome is a city on seven hills. Not mountains, hills. And the Greek word here, oros, is usually translated as mountains. But in this one particular verse, in Revelation, there are a lot of translations that seem to want to translate it as hills, mainly, probably, so that the translation fits the theology of this being Rome. But so many of the theologians, they'll say, well, yep, the one that is, has got to be Rome. Now, the one that is to come, well, wait a minute. Is that going to be Rome too? And then the one that is to come again? Is that going to be Rome 3? And so this has put up many theologians in a conundrum. So as to how this fits with the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic Caliphate, which is uh, uh, the interpretation that we're going from, uh, being the revised Roman Empire in, in Revelation 17, um, there is a candidate city that sits on seven mountains. So first... We will look at Rome, uh, Rome that's sitting on seven hills. And there you see the seven hills listed there. And then I'm going to show you from a web page of the Arab News. And they have this story published. And it's, it's easy for you to, to do an internet search and find it. And, the, and Arab News posted this article called The Seven Grand Mountains of Makkah, 
what's Mecca? We know it as Mecca, Saudi Arabia. And the article starts off saying, surrounded by seven distinct mountains, the once bare land, oh, desert, desolate, wilderness, located in a valley where no plants can grow, holds the holiest site in Islam. Not a holy site, the holiest site in Islam. And the Holy Kaaba, that's the black box that everybody around the whole world prays to, uh, is in the Grand Mosque of Mecca. And you know the whole Islamic world bows down either three times or five times a day towards this black box called the Holy Kaaba. In fact, um, in, in many hotels, especially in, uh, in the Middle East or Asia, uh, you will check into the hotel room and there'll be a little arrow like above the doorway and it will point the direction to Mecca. So, this calls for a mind of wisdom, seven heads or seven mountains. Okay, we've already discussed that, which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. Okay, so that's kind of step through the, the empires here. So we got the in, the Egyptian empire, fallen, Assyrian, fallen, Babylonian, fallen, Medo-Persian, fallen, the Greek, fallen. Okay, but there's one that is. Well, is from John's perspective around 100 AD is none other than what? the Roman Empire. That was the empire. And then for many years after, uh, after John, uh, the, let's say the first five or six centuries of the church, they kept saying, oh, it's got to be the Roman Empire. It's got to be the Roman Empire. Why? Well, for starters, there has not been a real successor from the Roman Empire. Um, and then all of a sudden, we have the, a new, whole new religion that rose up called Islam, okay? And so that resulted in the Islamic Caliphate, a strong, humongous uh, empire. That is the kingdom that has not yet come. And when it does come, he must remain only a little while. Um, as for the beast that was and is not, is an eighth and it belongs to the seven, and it goes on to destruction. And so there we've already seen the evidence that's pointing to a revived Islamic caliphate that's on the horizon. This would be an empire um, that was and is not, because the Ottoman Empire was uh, decommissioned came to an end at the end of World War I, but the next empire has to belong to that, belong to the seven, and we see that uh, on the horizon. So, reading on, verse 12. And the ten horns of the beast that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Now, these are of one mind, and they have handed over their power and their authority to the beast. So you're going, whoa, how in the world is this going to happen? You got 10 kings that are going to be part of the Antichrist coalition. Okay, I get that. They're going to be, uh, and they're going to be part of a, the Antichrist single hour of destruction of Babylon the Great. Okay, I get that. We're going to read later uh, where... Uh, they threw dust on their heads and wept and mourned and crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all have had ships of, at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she had been laid waste. Okay, we get that. But how in the world are we going to have ten kings uh, handing over their power, their authority, their resources to the kingdom of the Antichrist? I just, in a Roman context, anything European is going to have to go through many, many, many committees and iterations and reiterations and debates and uh, before uh, any decision is going to be made. However, in the context of an Islamic 
caliphate, you have heading it up a caliph, a caliph, a caliph,a in Arabic, who is going to be the supreme religious and political ruler of the entire Muslim world. Geopolitical boundaries are meaningless in a Islamic caliphate because it's all run by the caliph. And this is something that a caliph could accomplish with a single command. Now, let me just add a little more um, uh, potential uh, uh, supposition here, and that is, um, what if the caliph sees somebody coming from the east, from the land of Khorasan, from the stand states, and says, that is the Mahdi. The Mahdi is the Messiah of Islam. And if the Caliph says, we have now recognized the emergence of Mahdi, and we're going to, we're going to all line up behind him in his campaign. Uh, do you think 10 kings will have any problems relinquishing uh, their power by the orders of their supreme commander who is also saying there's somebody greater than me, the Messiah, Mahdi. It will happen just like that. So let's read on. Now, they will make a war on the Lamb, or at least from their their mindset. They're going to be warring against the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So we got the Lamb, and we got with him those that are called and chosen and faithful. This sounds like people. This doesn't sound like angels. So could this be the uh, Jewish people still in the ground? Well, we've already basically threw out the idea that if there wasn't any chosen people, any of the elect, then you're sure not going to convince the Antichrist to go battle against thin air. Um, so could this be the 144,000? Well, let's go back to the last um, recording of the 144,000 in Revelation 14, verse 1 where John looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000. And they had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay, well, that could be called the call of the chosen and the faithful. Uh, foretold by Moses in Deuteronomy, for you are a people holy to Yahweh your God. You, the Jewish people, you, the descendants of Jacob, Yahweh, your God, has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. And out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, I chose you, says Yahweh. Joel 3.16, Yahweh roars from where? From Zion. And utters his voice from where? Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord Yahweh is a refuge to his people a stronghold to the people of Israel. Uh, so he's going to have his people that um, he will be protecting. Isaiah 31, verse 8, And the Assyrians, remember we talked about uh, the Antichrist and the possibility of Assyrian roots and how the charge will come from Assyria by Assyrians. And the Assyrians shall fall by a sword. Oh, but this is not normal sword. Not of a man. And a sword not of a man, shall devour him, and he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor, and his rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers desert in the standard in panic. It declares Yahweh, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Okay. Verse 15. 
And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw with the prostitute is seated, well, they are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. Well, wait, the prostitute was riding on the beast. Now we're being told the Antichrist kingdom is going to hate the prostitute. And they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire for God has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose God's purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled and so while everybody on the surface thinks uh, the caliph or Mahdi is calling the shots uh -uh. the sovereign one is the Almighty God. Okay? The peoples and multitudes and nations and languages, that carries two thoughts. The influence of Babylon spans through all people groups. Also, that, that many are going to visit the city from all over the world. Hmm. I think we have that happening in Mecca. They and the beast will hate the prostitute. Well, there's got to be a story behind that. And trust me, there's a big story behind it. The alliance between Babylon the Great with the Antichrist has been one of convenience only. And there has been an underlying disrespect all along that we will uncover. Babylon the Great will come to an abrupt end. The Antichrist and his army will destroy her, but it is God who is orchestrating all of this. So verse 18, and the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, this is kind of an odd statement, so let's dissect it. The woman and the great city are one. I think that's a given, all right? And great city here is megas, as in megapolis. It means great in dignity and distinguished and eminent, illustrious and powerful. So that's the city great city, but that the city has dominion over the kings of the earth? Well, oddly enough, when I went and started looking into the Greek, there's no Greek word that is dominion. The literal translation in Greek is the, is um, sorry about that the great city having kingdom over the kings of the earth. So there is no dominion. The great city is just a kingdom, and a kingdom that its presence is over the kings of the earth. Okay, so this word for kingdom, uh, if we look at elsewhere and other places, uh, we see the same word in Matthew 3, 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. All right? So that kind of helps us put it into context. I mean, we got like two kingdoms, right? We got the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of the world. Nevertheless, this woman, this city, has the means to influence heads of states in today's world, in modern times. And we will definitely look into that as uh, we start into chapter 18. But let me just finish this. We've already, we've kind of gone through chapter 17 of what Babylon the Great is, the great prostitute, um, uh, the mother of all prostitutes, uh, and we have yet to go into chapter 18, but let's just look at these descriptions of Babylon the Great from both chapter 17 and 18, which we have not gone through yet. This is a literal city. This is a great city that is distinguished, powerful. How? Yet to come. This is a city found in the wilderness, in the desert, in, the, in an area that was once desolate. Um, I don't have it on the list, but this city is also what? Among seven mountains. And this is either a port or a city that's near the sea. Uh, also, we're going to read very much in Revelation 18, this city is not a producer of hardly anything other than money. 
and luxurious goods. But only because this city is a massive, massive consumer, not a producer. This is a city of idolatry, of epic proportions. Not only a prostitute, but a great prostitute. This is a city of excessive wealth, excessive luxury. This is a city of royalty. Hmm. This is a city of brazen arrogance. This is a city of economic and immoral seducer. That's what this city is. It seduces them. It seduces, it seduces the kings of the earth economically, and it seduces the kings of the earth immorally. It's also going to be seen as a city of slavery. It's a city that promotes murder of Jews and Christians. And this will be a spiritual and financial capital of the Islamic world. And guess what? She is hiding in plain sight. So we're going to end on that note. Once again, uh, just the pictures of the seven grand mountains of Maka. Uh, and um, so that's halfway through uh, of... Uh, Babylon the Great. We will we will finish this up next week. Uh, there is still a lot that we need to cover uh, to really see this woman who has been hiding in plain sight. So, amen and amen. Until then, God bless you.